Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. Well, we are in week 15 of our study through 2 Kings. We're nearing the end, and I would love to finish this book tonight. I know it might be wishful thinking, I might be overshooting, but let's just jump into it and see how we do. We uh, left off in chapter 23, oh, partway through, we're going to pick it up around verse 15. Let me just set the, set the um, scene for us. We are witnessing, in this book, we are witnessing the death of a nation. The long, painful, slow death of a nation. Twelve tribes, God's people, settling in the land, growing and prospering, now divided. Ten tribes of the north, northern kingdom of Israel, has already gone into captivity by the Assyrian Empire in 722 BC, the two remaining southern tribes remain for another century. But they are also going to be taken captive by the Babylonians and God's prized possession will be seemingly ended by the end of this book. So it's painful to watch the death of anyone we love or anything we love, especially if it's long and slow and painful. Same with a a nation. There has been a little bit of reprieve in the decline of the nation. That is, the, the northern tribes were all bad leaders. The southern tribes had a few good leaders, and it was some of those good leaders that brought a forestalling of the judgment of God to the southern kingdom, but nonetheless, the wheels of justice are turning, and eventually, they also will be destroyed and taken captive. One of the good guys was a guy by the name of Hezekiah. Now, we're reading about his grandson in chapter 23, Josiah, but Hezekiah was a good king, brought reform to the nation, cleaned up the temple, took down some of the high places of worship, But the prophet Isaiah came to King Hezekiah and said, this nation is going to go under and your sons and grandsons are going to face captivity and you're going to be spared, but they're going to suffer. And King Hezekiah, he was okay with that. He said, well, at least there's going to be peace in my day. So he, he wasn't a great leader in terms of foresight. But um, now we're dealing with Josiah. Josiah, a good king, has gone through the land. He has taken down some of the idols down in the southern kingdom. After Josiah, there's only a few kings left, and that will end the country or the kingdom of Judah. And Israel, all 12 tribes, will be in captivity for a period of years. So after King Josiah, his son Jehoahaz will be on the throne. We'll read about him. After Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim will be on the throne. He'll only last three months. And then after him, Jehoiachin, he'll last 11 years. Then Zedekiah, he'll last three months and 10 days. And then that's it. So God willing, we'll be able to read about all of them right now. So... uh, Look at verse 15 of chapter 23, where we left off in that section. So we know that King Josiah was going through Judah, mopping it up, tearing down the idols, taking away the false places of worship. But he doesn't stop with his own kingdom. He turns his efforts northward. Now remember, the ten northern tribes have already gone into captivity. The Assyrians have already taken them over. But he is not content with just cleaning up Judah. 
He wants to clean up the north. So look at verse 15. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel, that's up north, and the high place which Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, who made Israel's sin, had made both that altar and the high place, he broke down, and he burned the high place and crushed it to powder and burned the wooden image. I'm going to jog your memory and see if you can remember this. Back in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 13, there was a prophet, an unnamed prophet from Judah who showed... Now, this is 300 years before what we're reading. An unnamed prophet from Judah shows up in Samaria with King Jeroboam, who is at his altar burning incense to whatever God he's worshiping. And this prophet from Judah, seeing the king and standing before the altar, shouts out and he says, O altar, O altar, somebody is coming who will be born Josiah by name. This is 300 years before Josiah ever was born or ever existed. A boy will be born, Josiah by name. He will destroy this altar and burn on the altar the bones of the priests that offer sacrifices on the altar. He makes that prophecy. Jeroboam, you know, says, seize him. He leaves. And uh, it's an interesting prophecy. Now it's coming true. So Josiah has been born. He is the king. He does go up north. He does go to that altar. He does destroy it. As Josiah turned, verse 16, he saw the tombs that were there on the mountains, and he sent and took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar, just like that prophecy said, and defiled it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. It's right out of 1 Kings 13. Then he said, oh, what gravestone is this that I see? And the men of the city told him, it is the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah and proclaimed these things which you have done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, I like this, well, let him alone. Don't move his bones. He's one of the good guys. You know, he predicted that I'd be born and that he even gave my name. So, you know, don't mess up his bones, his grave. So they let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet who came from Samaria. You remember that after that unnamed prophet gave that prediction, he went and met with a prophet who lived in Bethel, who brought him into his house. He was a prophet from Samaria, and so it is making reference to that. Verse 19 then Josiah also took away all the shrines of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel made to provoke the Lord to anger, and he did to them according to all the deeds he had done in Bethel. He executed all the priests of the high places who were there on the altars and burned men's bones on them and returned to Jerusalem. Then the king commanded the people, saying, Keep the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of the covenant. Surely a Passover had never been held since the days of the judges. Such a Passover had never been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year, of King Josiah, this Passover was held before the Lord in Jerusalem. So King Josiah is now 26 years old. He has been reading the book of the law that was found in the temple. He reads the passage about keeping the Passover. He realizes, my people haven't even kept the Passover. So they're going back to the book. They're going back to the Bible. They're seeing that they need to obey the word of the Lord. Animal sacrifices had not been accomplished, performed in Jerusalem for years. So they're getting back to the basis for a relationship with God, which is the shedding of blood, atonement. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, it says in the law. So they're going back to the very thing that gave people standing before God 
An innocent victim would take my sins, take my place, take my punishment. And that is bringing revival in the country. By the way, the parallel passage to this in the book of 2 Chronicles says that King Josiah sacrificed 33,000 lambs at this Passover. So when it says there hadn't been such a Passover past or present, boy, you're not kidding. It was a massive going back to what the Bible said. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Let's get back to the book. Let's focus on atonement. And there's a corollary to that. Whenever the cross is preached faithfully, it will bring revival. Leave the cross out, you have no power. And so whenever there's revival, you can just see that the cross of Christ is exalted. Moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted mediums and spiritists, the household gods and the idols, all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and Jerusalem, that he might perform the words of the law, which were written in the book that Helkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. So they put all the spiritists out, all the necromancers out, all the palm readers, all the horoscope writers and readers now before him, there was no king like him. It's quite a statement. Who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor after him did any arise like him. So things are looking up. There's revival happening. There's people turning back to the book of the law, worshiping God, not so fast. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of his great wrath with which his anger was aroused against Judah because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will also remove Judah from my sight as I have removed Israel and will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen and the house which I said, my name shall be there. The judgment was coming. Could it have been avoided? At this point, no. It couldn't be avoided. It could only be forestalled. And it was forestalled a hundred years it was forestalled by a couple of people turning personally and then nationally back to their God, back to the Lord, bringing back the law of God, telling people, don't worship at these shrines, knocking those shrines down. So there was reprieve, but the wheels of justice are turning. There comes, there comes a point at which God just says, no, you, can, you can't avoid it, but you can just postpone it. You know, I, I often get asked by people about our nation. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And yes, when you go back to the founding of this country and you see some of the principles, many of them believers in God, yes, some of them were just deists, not believers, but many were believers and believed in God and thought that we as a nation should surrender and serve the Lord, and we had a purpose in building our nation. But if you compare that to today's rhetoric and sensitivities and sensibilities, it's vastly different. And so people often ask me, is it too late for the United States? I believe it is. I believe judgment cannot be avoided for the very same reasons that God's own people, the Jewish people, with whom he had an eternal covenant with and still does, went into captivity. For the very same reasons. They turned from the very same God. I think we can forestall it. We might have a few years, but it's coming. And it's unavoidable. And I, I just, the only hope I see is a little bit of a reprieve here and there. And, 
And, you know, you hope and pray and vote and do everything you can to uphold certain principles. But I think that you come to a place, well, like there's an old poem. There is a line we know not where, a time. There is a time we know not when, a line we know not where, that marks the destiny of man twixt sorrow and despair. There is a line, though by man unseen, once it has been crossed, even God in all his love hath sworn that all is lost. There comes a point when God must judge, though he loves people, he must judge the sin that is committed in a nation, and he holds nations accountable. Quote, that's my opinion. And I base it on Romans chapter 1, that when you have a nation that God gives to them what they say they want, the values they say they want to uphold, and he gives them over to what they say they want, and they vote that in, God gives it, God, the worst thing you can have is for God to give you what you say you want. Jesus taught us to pray, thy will be done. We're praying, my will be done. God says, really? You want it? You can have it, and I'll judge you for it. So God said, I'm going to remove them from my sight. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Yes. In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went to the aid of the king of Assyria, to the river Euphrates, and King Josiah went against him. We don't know why he went against him. We don't know what he was thinking. You can search history to find the answer. You won't find a suitable answer. But he got involved in the fight between two superpowers, and Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo. Megiddo is the town surrounded by a very important valley called the Valley of Armageddon. So this king dies in the Valley of Armageddon when he confronted him. Then his servants moved his body in a chariot from Megiddo, brought him to Jerusalem, and buried him in his own tomb. And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, anointed him, and made him king in his father's place. You need to know what's happening historically internationally at this time. The Babylonian Empire has gained strength. The Babylonian Empire is marching westward and conquering. And they are going to face off the Assyrian Empire. That has been the kingdom in charge of everything up to this point. And they're going to meet at a very strategic place on the Euphrates River, called Karshemish, the one of the most famous battles in history, the Battle of Karshemish, took place in 605 BC. The Assyrians against the Babylonians. The Babylonians will defeat the Assyrians, and the Babylonians, because they defeat the Assyrians, will be in charge of and conquer the rest of the world. They, they, they will become truly the first world-governing empire. But Pharaoh in Egypt marches northward along the coast to join the Assyrian army to fight against the Babylonian incursion. For some reason, King Josiah thinks, i got to stop Pharaoh Necho. So he's sort of siding with Babylon at this point, which is interesting because you remember previously Hezekiah, um, his grandfather Hezekiah, um, Envoys from Babylon, do you remember when they came to Hezekiah? Hezekiah had been sick, and he got better, and so they sent envoys from B Babylon and said, man, we're just, you know, here's a get well card, and ho hope you're doing good. Congratulations on recovering from your illness. How'd you do it? Of course, God granted him 15 years. And so he showed the envoys from Babylon all his treasures and all the treasures in the house of the Lord in the temple. And Isaiah said, who were those people that came to you? He said, oh, they were just a few buddies of mine from Babylon. What would you show them, Isaiah asked. I showed them everything. And he said, everything you showed them will go into captivity with these people to Babylon. 
And that's when he said, well, at least I'll have peace in my day. Well, now the day is coming for the Babylonians to take over. So this battle of Karshemish will decide the fate of the world. The one leading the battle for the Babylonians is a guy by the name of Prince Nebuchadnezzar. He's not king yet. His father, Nabopolassar, is the king of Babylon. Nabopolassar's son, Nebuchadnezzar, is the prince who fights the battle because he wins the battle. After he wins the battle, he will become king of Babylon. So that's, that's the backstory here. Verse 31, Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he became king. He reigned three months. Didn't even warm the throne. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jer Jeremiah of Libna. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all his fathers had done. Now Pharaoh Necho put him in prison in Riblah. Riblah is 65 miles north of Damascus in the land of Hamath, that he might not reign in Jerusalem. And he imposed on the land a tribute of 100 talents of silver and a talent of gold. Then Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in his place of his father Josiah and changed his name to Jehoiakim. Leaders often did this to basically say, you're not in charge, I am, you're my puppet. I'm renaming you. Pharaoh took Jehoahaz and went to Egypt and he died there. So this is before that battle of Karshemish. Pharaoh has moved north with his army to fight against the Babylonians with the Assyrians. Before the battle, he meets with, he summoned the king of Jerusalem up. Basically to say, hey, you little punk, I'm in charge now, you do what I say. And um, uh, he put him in prison because he found him obviously obstinate. And uh, verse 35, Jehoiakim gave the silver, the gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give the money according to the commandment of Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and the gold from the people of the land, from everyone, according to his assessment, to give it to Pharaoh Necho. Necho needs to fight a battle. He needs money to fight the battle. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king and reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebuda, the daughter of Padiah of Rumah, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his fathers had done. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, here it is, king of Babylon, now the prince has become the king after the battle of Karshemish, came up and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years, then he turned and rebelled against him. The year 605 BC, the year of that fateful battle of Karshemish. Now the prince becomes the king. The king now moves to take over Jerusalem, which had become a vassal of Egypt because Egypt killed Josiah at Megiddo. Follow? So now he comes against Jerusalem to assume control of that. And uh, Jehoiakim is the king. Jehoiakim goes along with it, but then he rebels against him. And notice this. And the Lord sent against him raiding bands of Chaldeans, bands of Syrians, bands of Moabites, bands of the people of Ammon. It's battle of the bands here. He sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servants, the prophets. Now, evidently, these are foreign raiders, different groups, different tribes. Why are they attacking? Well, humanly speaking, they're attacking because now Judah is weakened. And when his nation is weakened in leadership, other countries around it take advantage of it. That's always the case. When you get weak leaders in office or on a throne, other nations are watching it and deciding, what can I do? What can I get away with? And, and so there's a, a weakness in the leadership of Judah. It is compromised. And so other tribes will attack, cross the border, and you have problems. But on a spiritual level, notice again in verse 2, the Lord 
sent those bands. Same verse, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servants, the prophets. Verse 3, surely at the commandment of the Lord, this came upon Judah to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he had done. Proverbs 21 says, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it like water courses wherever he wishes to do it. So God is sovereign. God is in control of this. God is using Nebuchadnezzar as a pawn on his chessboard to move Judah to Babylon for a couple of reasons. Number one, this is a divine sentencing on Judah for their sin. Now it's catching up with them. The wages of sin is death, and in this case, the wages of sin is death and captivity. So it's a divine sentence. It's also a divine setup. Because in captivity, one of the captives is a young man by the name of Daniel who will be stationed in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar and give a witness to King Nebuchadnezzar and to King Darius and to King Cyrus, the successive kingdoms that follow, and make an impact and influence these nations greatly. So God is setting things up. Just remember that. Remember always that God is in ultimately in charge. And that whatever people mean for evil, just like Joseph said to his brothers, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good to save many people alive as it is this day. So yeah, it was a bummer that I got uh, thrown into a pit and it was a bummer that I got sold as a slave, human traffic to Egypt. And it was a bummer that I got thrown in jail all those years for doing nothing wrong. And it was a bummer, but... God was in it to do this. So even Joseph saw that in his own life. And so we should always remember that uh, there, are, there, are, there are natural reasons for things and at the same time supernatural things. So when you see the events of the world, rub your chin and say, what is God up to? He's working a trick somewhere. Just got to watch for it. Verse 4, also, and also because of the innocent blood that he shed, for he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. Those are heavy words. The Lord would not pardon? Why would the Lord not pardon sin? I'm glad you asked. God can only pardon sin that is repented of, that is confessed. God didn't just forgive sin willy-nilly. Jesus died for the sins of the world. Not everybody is saved in the world. Only those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Only those who ask for forgiveness will be forgiven. Pardon is extended freely. God wants to do it. But pardon is conditioned upon repentance. This is important to remember because there is a philosophy, a religious philosophy called universalism. Universalism teaches universal reconciliation that ultimately everyone will be saved. Doesn't matter who you are, what you believe in, all roads lead to God, smile, and we'll all go to heaven one day. That's a huge lie. Huge lie. The, the, the way is narrow, Jesus said, and few enter in to that straight gate. So the Lord would not pardon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Yep, they are. Now, Jehoiakim goes by another name, Jeconiah or Coniah. If I have time, shout that out to me and I'll tell you the rest of the story, but we have to move on because I'd, I'd, like I'd like to move on to, to get this done. But uh, Jehoiakim did, so the, the prophecies of Jeremiah fit during the reign of Jehoiakim, largely. So Jeremiah noted that King Jehoiakim, a.k.a. Jeconiah, a.k.a. Kaniah, same dude, killed a prophet named Urijah, wanted to kill Jeremiah and his buddy Baruch. And so you notice in verse 4, 
because of the innocent blood that he shed, he filled Jerusalem with blood. So he's killing righteous people right and left, and God wouldn't pardon that. So Jehoiakim, verse 6, rested with his fathers. Then Jehoiachin, these names, his son rested in his place, reigned in his place. And the king of Egypt did not come out of his land anymore, for the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River. So he's now the big dog on the block in charge, reigning over everything. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother's name was Nehushta. Do you remember the name Nehushtan? Remember that brass snake they named Nehushtan, a thing of brass? Nehushta sounds very similar because it's the same word. Nehushta means brassy. So I don't know if this gal was just loud or yeah, she had a voice that grated on you when she talked. I don't know, but her name is Brassy, Nehushta. The daughter of El Elnathan of Jerusalem, he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city as his servants were besieging it. That is, he came personally. And history does say Nebuchadnezzar personally came to the city of Jerusalem. So his eyes saw the holy city himself. Jehoiachin, king of Judah, his mother, his servants, his princes, all of his officers went out to the king of Babylon and the king of, um, uh, to the king of Babylon. And the king of Babylon in the eighth year of his reign took him prisoner. And he carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. And he cut in pieces all the articles of gold which Solomon, the king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. And he also carried into captivity all Jerusalem, all the captains, all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives, all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land. Now, can anybody tell me where in verse 13 it talks about all the treasures of the house of the Lord taken to Babylon? Can anybody tell me where these treasures of the house of the Lord show up again? Daniel chapter 5. She said at the party, yes. In Daniel chapter 5, the king of Babylon at that time is Bel. Shazer. And Belshazzar is having a drunken feast, inviting lords and ladies, all his buddies having a drunken orgy, getting just plastered. Key word, plastered. And as he's doing it, he goes, hey, bring out the vessels from the house of that Yahweh God in Judah. Bring them out. Let's drink from them. He crossed the line. And Daniel was brought in because during the party, the king saw a hand of a man start writing on the plaster of the wall opposite him. And it freaked him out. It would freak me out just to see a hand floating in midair, writing a message to me on the wall. I mean, how, how off the wall would that be? So he sees it <laughs> on the wall, and, and the, the message says, many, many, tackle you farson, which means you've been weighed in the balances and you're a lightweight. You've been found wanting and you're about to be destroyed. And that night, the kingdom was taken over by the Medes and the Persians, the very night of that party. So he learned a lesson about messing too much with the treasures from the house of the Lord. Verse 15, he carried Jehoiachin captive to Babylon. The king's mother, the king's wives, the officers, the mighty men from the land he carried into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. Okay, now you got to know this. The Babylonians came against the city of Jerusalem three times. 605 B.C. was the first time. He took... Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, a.k.a. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to Babylon. 
He came again in 597 BC. Josephus said in 597, he took like 10,000 captives with him and he'll come again and take thousands more. Uh, so 605, 597, finally will be 586 BC. Key date, 586 BC is when Jerusalem will be destroyed by fire by the Babylonians, as we'll see. All the valiant men, 7,000, and craftsmen and smiths, 1,000, all who were strong and fit for war, these the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. Then the king of Babylon made Mataniah, Jehoiachin's uncle, king in his place and changed his name to Zedekiah. He's the last king. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. He reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. He did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah that finally cast them out from his presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. He rebelled if you're interested, you Bible students, he rebelled by signing a treaty with the next pharaoh of Egypt, Pharaoh Hafra, against the Babylonians, which didn't work because Babylon was too strong. There's always nations trying to take over, and they won't be successful until the Medo-Persian Empire in Daniel chapter 5. But he, Zedekiah tried, and, and so, so notice this, Zedekiah is the uncle of Jehoiachin. Okay, so I mentioned that Jehoiakim, uh, uh, Jehoiakim. So remember I mentioned that Jehoiakim was also named Jeconiah or Kaniah? Now let me just get back to that because I think I have enough time because we're about to finish chapter 25. We're there. We're at the finish line. Now, God made a prediction through Jeremiah the prophet in Jeremiah 22 against King Jehoiakim, also known as Jeconiah, also known as Kaniah. And he said, you know, you're such a wicked king that I, you will be rendered childless no one from your seed, none of your offspring, will ever reign on the throne of Judah forever. So his line was cursed and cut off in that prophecy. And so the uncle Zedekiah, not a son, the uncle becomes king. Zedekiah is the last king of Judah. So God effectively cuts off the lineage of the kings of Judah. Well, you have a problem. The problem is all of the predictions God has made that the line of King David will last forever. And somebody will sit on the throne forever from the line of King David. And that poses a problem for us who believe in Jesus, who is from the tribe of Judah and of the seed of David to fulfill the promises of ruling and reigning forever. And it is a problem until you get to the genealogies in Matthew and in Luke. And in the genealogy in Matthew, it's the genealogy of Joseph. And in the genealogy, it follows all the way from Abraham down through Jeconiah, down to Joseph, and then to Jesus. That bloodline is cursed. And so, well, we have a problem. Well, Jesus wasn't the son of Joseph. Hold that thought. You get to the very next genealogy found in the Gospel of Luke. It is the genealogy also through the line of David, but go, goes down to Mary. But it's a different set of names because it's a different bloodline. It doesn't go to David through Solomon, Jeconiah and Solomon, the royal route like David or like Joseph's uh, genealogy in Matthew. It goes through the genealogy of the son of David named Nathan all the way back to King David. A different bloodline, but a royal bloodline nonetheless. So you've got the official royal bloodline that is cursed 
in Matthew, and then you have the bloodline that is not cursed in Luke, both going back to King David. The only way you can fix the blood curse in Jeremiah 22, the only solution to the curse is a virgin birth. It's the only way to fix it. Now, with the virgin birth, you have Jesus conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit, not Joseph. So you have the royal bloodline going back to Jeconiah, all the way to Solomon, all the way to David, all the kings of Judah. That's cursed, but Mary's is not. And so the virgin birth solves the problem that is presented in Jeremiah 22. So if you ever wonder, why is that important that the, there's a virgin birth and I have to believe it? That's why. So that's just a little FYI. That's just a little extra credit. Just wanted to throw that in. Now it came to pass, verse 1, chapter 25. We're doing it. We're doing it. In the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of that month, that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and his army came against Jerusalem and camped against it built a siege wall against it all around. Eighteen months they camped outside the walls of Jerusalem. From 588 to 586 B.C., they camped, they starved the people out, they uh, limited their resources. It was a very long, painful siege. So the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. The city wall was broken through, and all the men of war fled by night by the gate between the two walls, which is by the king's garden. Even though the Chaldeans were still encamped all around against the city, and the king went by the way of the plain. First of all, when the city fell, there was a prophet who watched it fall. He was outside the city walls watching the walls go down, and he was weeping as he was writing his book of lamentations. His name is Jeremiah the prophet. He records the final fall of the city, the wails, the fire, the suffering. And he laments. When you go to Israel with us and we take you to the garden tomb, there is a place that is by the bus station that many of the tour guides will point out as possibly the area of Golgotha, Calvary, where Jesus was crucified. That is under dispute. But one thing that is more certain is there is a cave underneath, a grotto, that has historically, traditionally, has been called the Grotto of the Prophet of Jeremiah. And the prophet, uh, the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah, it is said, sat in that grotto watching the walls fall, writing the Book of Lamentations. So remember that when you're there and you see it, it's pointed out, you'll think back, uh, perhaps, to chapter 25 of 2 Kings or the Book of Lamentations. So, King escapes through the wall, goes down through the Kidron Valley, out toward Jericho. He's trying to escape, but the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered from him, and they took the king, this is Zedekiah, brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah. They brought him all the way up to Syria and pronounced judgment on him. Now watch this. Then they killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. So King Zedekiah had to watch Nebuchadnezzar murder his sons in front of him. Then, look at this, put out the eyes of Zedekiah. You can see why? So that the last visual memory will be the murder of his sons. That's what he would have to live with the rest of his life before they put his eyes out. So he's blinded. They bound him with bronze fetters and took him to Babylon. Now in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which is the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. Now, I, I just got to show you something, and I hope you think 
this is as interesting as I think it is. Because you have two prophecies about what we just read about King Zedekiah that if you were to read them at face value, you might think there's a contradiction. And, and I want to show you something. So in Jeremiah chapter 32, it predicts this. And Zedekiah, the king of Judah, shall not escape from the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him face to face, and see him eye to eye. Then he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he shall be until I visit him, says the Lord. That's the prophecy of Jeremiah. Well, there was another prophet who was hanging around, prophesying at that time, named Zeke or Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, the prophet, writes this in Ezekiel chapter 12. And the prince who is among them shall bear his belongings on his shoulder as twilight and go out. Uh, they shall dig through the wall to carry them out through it. They shall cover his face. Uh, uh, he shall cover his face so that he cannot see the ground with his eyes. I will spread my net over him. Uh, he shall be caught in my snare. I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans, yet he shall not see it, though he shall die there. Now, somebody might read these two predictions if they were to read them side by side and say, well, there's a contradiction. One says he's going to see the king of Babylon face to face and be taken to Babylon. The other says that... Uh, um, uh, he, he shall go to Babylon, but not see it. So go back to our text, and you see how it is resolved. He sees the king of Babylon face to face. Judgment is pronounced on him. And then his eyes are put out. He is taken to Babylon, but he doesn't see it because he's blinded. So you have to be careful with Bible prophecy to go. Don't gloss over the details. Go deeper in the details. Because the thing about Bible prophecy is that the odds are stacked against it ever being fulfilled. And then it is fulfilled. To show you that man can do this, only God can predict this. So you have a prediction and then you add multiple contingencies and details, layers of details that exponentially make it more difficult for it ever to happen. And then it happens. And people go, Wow, that's the Lord. And so it is with this prophecy, or so it was with naming Josiah 300 years before he was born, etc. This stuff happens all over the scriptures. So he's taken to Babylon. Verse 9, he burned the house of the Lord. That's the temple. He burned the house of the Lord and the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great men he burned with fire. And the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guards broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around. When we get to the book of Nehemiah, when Nehemiah is in Persia, and he sees men from Jerusalem, he goes, Hey, how are things going in Jerusalem since you guys were able to go back? How are the captives doing, those who escaped? And they came back with a bad report saying, oh, it's horrible, everybody's discouraged, for the walls are broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. It's recounting the fact that we've come back, but it's, the desolation is so bad that everybody's discouraged. When you come with us to Jerusalem, we can stand and show you the excavations of the very homes with burn marks still in them, charcoal fragments still in the walls where the fires occurred around Jerusalem in 586 B.C. The archaeologists can point. This is the Babylonian fire. You can see it today with your own eyes. This far, you're looking that far back into the past. You know, we go to Santa Fe and say, man, this is really old. And then you go to Jerusalem and you look at the Temple of Solomon and the stones remaining and the walls burned with fire and the fragments and the pottery. And you go, now that's old. That's Bible old. That's Old Testament old. 
Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive the rest of the people who remained in the city, the defectors who deserted to the king of Babylon with the rest of the multitude. But the captain of the guard left some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers. The bronze pillars that were in the house of the Lord, the carts, the bronze sea that, was, that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broken pieces, carried their bronze to Babylon, took away the pots, shovels, trimmers, spoons, bronze utensils with which the priests ministered, the fire pans, basins, uh, the things of solid gold, solid silver, the king of the guard took away. The two pillars, one sea, that's the place of washing, the carts which Solomon made for the house of the Lord, the bronze of all the articles was beyond measure. Now the author here points to the two pillars, wants us to look at those or remember those two pillars. Remember those in the temple of Solomon? They had names. Remember they were given names. One was named Jachin. The other was named Boaz. The pillars were named Jachin means God establishes or he will establish. Um, uh, the second one, Boaz, means strength or in him is strength. So the testimony of the two pillars is God has established Judah and God is the strength of Judah. In him is strength. And I think the author is trying to show us the irony of this here the nation that once had the testimony that God established it and the Lord is its strength, the strength has departed. And the very nation that God established, he has now taken away. That's his prerogative. Because they no longer allowed the Lord to establish it. They no longer kept the Lord as their strength. They departed from it. And so that was taken away. One of the big questions is, where is the Ark of the Covenant? Maybe we'll get to that one day, but. Well, uh, verse 17, the height of one pillar was 18 cubits. The capital on it was bronze. We read about all that. The height of the capital was three cubits. The network of the pomegranates. We read all about this previously in the book. Verse 18, the captain of the guard took Sariah. The chief priest, Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three doorkeepers. He also took out of the city an officer who had charge of the men of war, five men of the king's close associates who were found in the city, the principal scribe of the army, who mustered the people of the land, and 60 men of the people of the land who were found in the city. So Nebuzaradan, this is just the chief of the of the army, the captain of the guard, took these and brought them to the king of Babylon, way up north at Riblah, remember 65 miles north of Damascus, that's where his encampment was. And then the king of Babylon struck them and put them to death at Riblah in the land of Hamath. Thus Judah was carried away captive from its own land. Then he made Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, governor over the people who remained in the land of Judah. Just FYI, see that name, Shaphan? That name has been found in a piece of pottery in the digs I was talking about at the destruction of the temple in 586. We have pottery that bears the name uh, written just like it is here, though in Hebrew, not in English. What verse? Where was I? 22, 23. So all the captains of the armies, their men, heard the king of Babylon that had made Gedaliah the governor, came to him at Mizpah, Ishmael, the son of this guy, that guy, the other guy, all those hard names. And Gedaliah, verse 24, took an oath before them. And their men said to them, don't be afraid of the servants of the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land. Serve the king of Babylon and it will go well with you. Remember Jeremiah in chapter 29 told the captives in Babylon the same thing, submit to them, build houses, marry wives, obey them, etc. Now he's saying, somebody else is saying that to the captives. Um, they didn't like that message. It happened the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of all these other hard names, um, struck and killed Gedaliah, the Jews and the Chaldeans, who were with him at Mizpah, and all the people, small and great, captains of the armies, arose and went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. So they killed the governor that they put in Judah, 
And then after that, they go, oh, man, we just killed somebody and we're in trouble. So they ran away to Egypt. Now it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month on the 27th day of the month, that evil Merodach. What a weird name. And anytime you have, I know that's just a Babylonian name, but it, you know, in English it's translated evil Merodach. You know, you just know not a, it's like, I don't know, was he named after evil Knievel? Who knows? Uh, evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, released Jehoiachin, king of Judah, from prison. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. Now, why did he do that? We don't know, but who do you think who was in the court of Babylon who may have influenced the Babylonian king to be easy on the king of Judah? Could be Daniel. And scholars believe that it could have been Daniel who sweetened the pot. So, you know, be easy on this guy. You know, I'm a pretty good guy and I serve you well. So he could have um, influenced him that way. So Jehoiah Chin changed from his prison garments and he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. And as for his provisions, there was regular ration given him by the king, a portion for each day, all the days of his life. We finish the book. I know, it's quite a feat. You, you did it. You read it. We read it all. Now we basically just read the rest of it tonight. But the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, there were 20 kings, right? Nine different dynasties, 20 kings, all of them bad. Southern kingdom of Judah, one dynasty. Dynasty of King David. 19 kings, one queen mother who, of Athaliah, who usurped the throne. 12 evil, nine good. One dynasty. Now, quick, quick question as we close. Whatever did happen to that Ark of the Covenant? You know, that has been a question that people have asked. Not only has Indiana Jones been looking for it, but archaeologists have been looking for it because nobody knows what happened to it. Now, some scholars, the bulk of scholars, assume the Babylonians took it with them to Babylon because they pillaged the temple. However... It would seem to other archaeologists that had they taken the Ark of the Covenant, they would have stated because it said they took the sea and the bronze pillars and they start naming the things. Surely they would have named this most important feature with them. Others believe that it is buried to this day underneath the Temple Mount where the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim Mosque, sits. Because when they were digging the tunnel structure to look at the Western Wall excavations, they found a gate and a network of tunnels underneath the Temple Mount they believed that the priest and the rabbis had access to in case they were attacked, they could hide it underneath the Temple Mount. The only problem is you can't excavate because it is completely dominated and watched by the Muslim authorities. So you would you would create World War III if you were to dig under there uh, at this point. Others believe that Jeremiah the prophet took it to Mount Nebo and buried it in a cave. Mount Nebo is where Moses died and where he viewed the promised land. Others believe that Jeremiah took it to the grotto of Jeremiah outside the walls of Jerusalem, and some assert that it's still there. Others believe it's in Ethiopia, etc., etc., etc. So... Nobody knows, take your pick. Quick question. All the kings that we have studied, all the kingdoms that we have studied, what made the difference in the kingdoms that we have read about in the book of 2 Kings? What made the difference good or, or, or bad? The king, the, whoever was reigning. If you had a good king, things went well with those people, typically. If you had a bad king, they turned against the Lord, brought in idolatry. We saw how history played out. So 
It depends on the king. Leaders determine legacy. It all depends who your king is. So who's your king? Who rules over your life? If it's King Jesus, you're in good shape now and forevermore. If you're the king of your life, and if your theme song at your funeral is, I did it my way, I feel such pity for you. Really? Have it your way. And God let Israel and Judah have it their way. They loved idols so much, God said, I'll take you to Idol Central, baby. Babylon makes your idols seem like nothing. He took them to the heart of the idolatrous world at the time, Babylon itself. So you don't want it your way. You want it his way. Not my will be done, thy will be done. Father, that's what we pray. Like Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever in Jesus' name. Amen. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.